Hello brothers and sisters in Christ. I decided we'd do a study this today on believing in vain. We talked about it, but I kind of wanted to give some examples and really go into it just a little bit more than we normally do, okay? And see what God's shown me, okay? So, I'm a King James Bible believer, so please have your King James Bibles out and following along. I'm going to try to stand here and do a teaching, so I'll be going through the clipboard and saying turn here, turn there. So, first, vain the word vain what does the word vain mean uh -huh. empty worthless having no substance value or importance uh -huh. fruitless empty again as another definition um, false deceitful not genuine okay so when it says belief in vain that we're going to be talking about you know it's not genuine it's worthless has no value, no importance. So Ecclesiastes 1.17 And I gave my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. I perceive that this also is vexation of spirits. For in much wisdom is much grief, and he that increaseth knowledge increaseth sorrow. Okay. I wanted to say this real quick, but how come, how often are we seeing this today, okay? I gave my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. We try to stu study this Word of God hardcore to know wisdom. Remember, Greeks seek after wisdom, and you're to ask God, who give it to all men liberally, Lord, I need wisdom. Okay. But we're also looking at the world, and we're starting to know and see the madness and folly of this world. And as we go through this study, we're going to see the madness and the folly of this world. Okay. So turn to Romans chapter 1, verse 20. That's where we're going to start. For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly, clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead. Okay. So that they are without excuse, because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations. Remember, we just learned, read there about the definitions of vain. Okay, it's uh, having no. It's worthless. It's empty. It's fruitless. Right? It's false. Mm -hmm. And their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. We talked about that in Ecclesiastes. And changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. And I started out with this because it just seems like the more I study it, and the more we go through it, brothers and sisters in Christ, it just seems like what's going on is the world's trying to create their own Jesus Christ, vain in their imaginations. They want a Jesus Christ that conforms to them. And the lost world that rejects Jesus Christ, they want a God that conforms to them. Okay, why? So they can believe what they want to believe and live how they want to live. They're their own final authority. What did Eve, uh, Satan tell Eve in the garden? You can be as gods, knowing good and evil. Right? Yea, hath God said. It's all, that's what it's all about. And as we read through this, believing in vain, uh, the different Jesus that's in here, the different gospels and what people want to believe that's what it's all about okay? they want to live how they want to live and in order to do that they got to believe what they want to believe they don't have to believe absolute truth they don't have to have a final authority it's just whatever they want okay uh, first corinthians 15 1 i've always preached this i'm going to preach it again okay moreover brethren i declare unto you the gospel which i preached unto you which also you have received and wherein ye stand Okay. By which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory that what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. We're going to go through here and see all these different ways that you can believe in vain. And Paul didn't preach that. He comes in and corrects them and says, you're not believing what I preached. So your belief is in vain. And ultimately, the belief is this. I don't want to go to hell. I want to go to heaven. So how can you believe be in vain? You're believing in the wrong way to heaven, and you're still on your way to hell. Okay. What's the truth? Uh, verse 3, For I delivered unto you first of all 
that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. So how do you not believe in vain? Your belief being real and genuine. You're believing in the really true salvation, plan of salvation in the real Jesus Christ. What's the true salvation, plan of salvation? Repent. Uh, 2 Corinthians 7, 9. Now rejoice not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed to repentance, for you were made sorry after a godly manner, that ye might receive damage by us in nothing, for godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrows of the world worketh death. It says up there that sorrow, that he sorrowed to repentance. Not that she, you had worldly sorrow, you were sorry for the consequences, like we're talking about, people don't want to go to hell, they're sorry for the consequences. But they're not sorry for sinning against God. Okay? They like their sin. That's why they created Jesus that's okay with their sin. They don't have to have a changed life. They don't have to give up their sin after salvation. Not with their Jesus. Not with their plan of salvation. Okay? Next step, believe. Okay? Belief in the gospel. Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. You have to believe the gospel before God saves you. And as we're going to find out, your faith doesn't save you. Your belief in the finished work of Jesus Christ doesn't save you. It comes before God saves you. So all this takes faith, and it comes before God saves you. Amen. Power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Okay. It says, I'm not ashamed. We're going to get into the next part, confess and ask, and it's all about not being ashamed. Mm -hmm. Finished work of Jesus on the cross. We've talked about this in more detail. The suffering that Jesus went through before he was even nailed to the cross. And that he died for the sins of the world. He was buried... And three days later, he rose from the dead, proving that he is God. And one of the things you can believe in vain, and we're going to jump in ahead a little bit, is the resurrection. If you don't believe in the resurrection, you're believing in, a G in vain. All right. Confess and ask, Romans 10, 8. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. Heart, mouth, belief, and it comes out through the mouth. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. That is the word of faith which we preach, that if thou shalt confess the, with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, but with the mouth confession is made, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. There we see it again. This happens before you get saved. Uh, for the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Remember the belief that we talked about that leads, it's the power of God unto salvation. And you're not to be ashamed of it. People who take out, confess, and ask, they're ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the Lord, same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Okay? Step one, you repent. You come to God broken and having godly sorrow. Step two, you believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Death, burial, and resurrection, how he died. Okay. Step three, you confess. The reason people ask me, and I'll say it again, why do you add repentance to belief? Well, if you followed along the studies we've been doing, brothers and sisters in Christ, about salvation uh, for lost sinners... I, to, I proved in there with, through Scripture that if you skip repentance, you're not capable of believing the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. That's why you confess both. Repentance is linked to the belief in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. They go hand in hand. You take one out, you can't do the other. If you take the belief out, you can't truly repent. Mm -hmm. That's why you confess both. And then you ask God to save you. God does the saving. I'm going to go ahead and read 14 because they always like to attack us saying, we never keep reading, we never keep reading. 14, how then shall they call upon him whom they have not believed? Didn't, what were the steps we just talked about? Did belief come before calling on the name of the Lord? Uh, yeah, because it comes from the heart. Uh -huh. Belief comes from the heart, not the head. And how shall they believe on him whom they've not heard? 
We're supposed to be going out and preaching the gospel. That's how this person, how I got saved, brothers and sisters, how you got saved. That's how all this is truth. Okay, We know it's truth because we're saved and this is how we got saved because somebody preached the gospel to us. And how shall they hear without a preacher? Someone preached the gospel to us. Now, 2 Corinthians, that is the true way of believing where it's not in vain. That's the true plan of salvation. It preaches the true Jesus Christ of the King James Bible. You won't find the true Jesus Christ in the Bible for versions. It teaches an antichrist. Okay. What was it? New King James makes Jesus out to be a liar. Uh, the NIV t says Jesus... Instead of saying Jesus Christ is coming the flesh, it says has come in the flesh. It, they keep tearing Jesus down and promoting an antichrist. And when the antichrist shows up, he's going to be the Jesus of all these Bible perversions. Mm -hmm. The true Jesus Christ and the true plan of salvation can be found in the King James Bible. All the other Bible perversions, they took repentance out hardcore. Some of them repentance all the way out. Mm -hmm. 2 Corinthians 11.1 1. What's going on here with the belief in vain? Would to God you could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, ye can be as gods. Remember we're talking about how they're trying to tear Jesus down, and they're trying to come up with their own vain imaginations, they're coming up with their own Jesus that conforms to them so they can believe what they want to believe and live how they want to be, live. And how far does that go back to Eve in the garden, the serpent? Through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preach, preach another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit, which we ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, ye might wear, well bear with him. And I've always preached this, the bear with him part's talking about Satan. Where's Satan going? Why was hell created? It was created for the devil and his angels. Hell wasn't created for, the, for mankind. Okay? You don't have to go to hell. Follow those steps. If you're lost and you're watching this, follow the true plan of salvation. Come to God broken. Repent. Okay? Have godly sorrow for sinning against Him. When you're sorry about something, you don't want to do it. You know you keep doing it, and you know you can't, you know, you can't clean up your life. You're a sinful, wicked person. You need help, but you don't want to do it anymore. But you need help. What, what do I do? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Mm -hmm. Confess both in prayer, just in your own words. Confess that you're a sinner, and tell the Lord that you believe in Jesus Christ, that He is God fully and completely, and He died to pay for your sins, and then ask God to save you. I don't know why it's so hard, not for you that are lost, I'm not, but that's what you need to do. To those who are professing to be saved, I don't see why that's so hard. Well, as we're learning in this study, it's not that it's hard. They don't want to believe in the real Jesus Christ. They like this worldly Jesus Christ that lets them do what they want, and believe what they want. Would Satan offer, um, try to tempt Jesus with on the, uh, when he went and fasted for 40 days? Uh, all these kingdoms, the world, I'll give you the world if you but worship me. The Jesus they worship is Satan, an antichrist, a counterfeit. Uh -huh. And that's what's going on. All these false gospel, false plans of salvation are going on, and servants of Satan are working hard. I had a brother say this, uh, get asked, you know, is it possible for Satan, demons, to attack a Christian? And why would they do that? Okay. We talked about it. If they can't keep you from getting saved, they're going to try to get God to punish you. Okay. They're going to try to steal your rewards in heaven. They're trying to keep you from getting rewards. They're there to mess you up. But oftentimes you'll realize, brothers and sisters of Christ, in your walk with the Lord, it's more your flesh that you're fighting, not really demons and um, Satan when it comes to your walk with the Lord. You're fighting them when it comes to preaching the gospel and preaching absolute truths. They're ministers of Satan. They're servants that are out there that we're going to start talking about. That's who we're fighting a lot, absolutely. But in your walk with the Lord, the main 
adversary you're going to have is your flesh. Right? Why does, and when the demons and Satan try to tempt you, it's because they're trying to mess you up. He's the lowercase g God of this world, Satan. God's given him dominion. He still has to answer to God Almighty, but he's given him dominion of this world. Okay. Now, the first part, we're getting into it now, of not uh, believing in vain. What's uh, one of the ways people believe in vain? Uh, they don't believe in the resurrection. And as we're going to get here, the Bible talks about being double-minded. Okay, Those people will say, I'll believe in the resurrection, but when you ask them and get in deeper on some of their beliefs, they don't really believe in the resurrection. Okay. Or they believe in the resurrection, but they don't believe Jesus is God. Mm -hmm. We're going to get into some false religions, but that's towards the end. So no resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15, 12. Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? Mm -hmm. So he's preaching that Jesus rose from the dead. But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain? And your faith is also vain. Yeah, if Jesus did not raise from the dead three days later to prove that he is God fully and completely, that it was God's blood that was shed on Calvary, then us preaching the gospel is vain. Us preaching, or our faith is also vain. Okay. That's how important the resurrection is. Yea, and we are found, found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that He raised up Christ, whom He has raised up, whom He raised not up. Okay. If so be that he, the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised? And if Christ be not raised, your faith is in or your faith is vain. Ye are yet in your sins. Talked about this in another study because people were kind of attacking 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, where it says how he died. I do believe that how Jesus died is important. And pleading the blood, the reason we're against that is most of the time when you see people that really get into pleading the blood, it becomes witchcraft. Uh, Brother Brian, I'll link it below if I can find it, or maybe I'll just make a... Uh, channel but one of his old um, audio studies about pleading the blood people think it's not about it's really just people get really crazy and out there okay you got to plead the blood around the house to protect the house you got to plead the blood here to protect that you got to plead the blood for your job to keep your job and it gets really out there but the point I'm making here is yes how Jesus died is important the blood that was shed on the cross is important but without the resurrection, it's worthless. That blood can do nothing for you if you don't believe in the resurrection. You are yet in your sins. That blood didn't wash your sins away if there's no resurrection. If Jesus isn't God fully and completely. Mm -hmm. Only God's blood can wash your sins away. Verse 18, Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished, people in the past that died believing in Jesus Christ. Uh -huh. And I mean, not, before, not in the Old Testament, but when these letters are written, Paul's already done a lot of his ministry. A lot of time has passed. He could have saved an old man that died a few years later, or not saved. He could have preached the gospel, so God saved an old man, and a few days later, he died. So everyone from the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ to up to the point that he's writing this letter to the Corinthians that had passed away, they also are perished. If there's no resurrection, then God's blood can do nothing. And that's the whole point, brethren, that, the, that us brothers were trying to push. Some might not have done it that well, but that's what we're trying to push. If you don't believe in the resurrection, the blood is worthless. And today, a lot of people just focus on the blood and not the resurrection. It's all about the blood. It's all about the blood. And they start to ignore the resurrection. Not that they don't believe in it, but they start to ignore it like it's not a big deal. It is a big deal. And that we're going to read about it right here. John 8, 17. It is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. Okay. I read this in the past one. This isn't the main one we're going to get into, but 
I wanted to read this because it proves the Godhead and you got to listen to it. And we're going to get into the Godhead and why it's important when it comes to the resurrection. Right. John 8, 17, it is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. Okay. Remember, we just did that in uh, Matthew 18, trying to talk about Matthew 18. You have to have two to three witnesses so everything can be established. Okay. I am one that bear witness of myself, and the Father that sent me bear witness of me. Then said they unto him, Where is thy father? Jesus answered, Ye neither know me nor my father. If ye had known me, ye would have known my father also. Okay. There's the two witnesses. These words spake Jesus in the treasury as he taught in the temple, and no man laid hands on him, for his hour was not yet come. Then said Jesus again unto them, I go my way, and ye shall seek me, and shall die in your sins. Whether I go, ye cannot come. Then said the Jews, Will he kill himself? Because he saith, Whether I go, ye cannot come. And he said unto them, Ye are from beneath, I am from above. Ye are of this world, I am not of this world. I said, Therefore ye shall unto you that ye shall die in your sins for if ye believe not that I am he ye shall die in your sins okay he's talking about God the Father and why is this important we're going to tie it in to the resurrection okay Jesus is God fully and completely there's only but one capital G God first Corinthians 8 6 the Father and people are already trying to destroy that passage so they can destroy the Godhead you know what they can't and it's getting to the point where I'm trying to plead with people who mention the Trinity and they believe in the Trinity. I'm trying to have compassion or charity and love for them to preach the truth for them. But it's getting to the point where I'm just getting to the point where if you want the Trinity, take it. See what happens. We're going to talk about it. Your belief is in vain. John 5, 31. Here's where we get to the witness. All right. That one was just talking about that Jesus and God the Father are one, and we're going to get into resurrection. Only one person can resurrect Jesus Christ. But how many actually resurrected Jesus Christ? John 5, 31, If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. We just read in John 8, 17 that Jesus is a witness. But if he's the only witness, his witness is not true. Why? Because before two or three witnesses, may, everything may be established. I think that's in Deuteronomy. There is another that beareth witness of me, and I know that the witness which he witnessed of me is true. Ye, ye sent unto John, and he bear witness unto the truth. You say, what does that have to do anything? It's John. What does it have to do with the Godhead, I mean? Let's keep reading. But I receive not testimony from man, but these things I say that ye might be saved. He was a burning and a shining light. If you guys watched that study we did about the glory of the Lord on how it manifests itself, um, the Holy Spirit, okay, manifests itself like that. Okay? And you were willing for a season to rejoice in His light. The Holy Spirit was in John. Back then, the Holy Spirit wasn't in everybody. God chose people to let them have His Holy Spirit in them. So what's really testifying of Jesus Christ? John or the Holy Spirit that's speaking through John? So we have Jesus Christ as a witness, now we have the Holy Spirit as a witness, but I have a greater witness than that of John. For the works which the Father hath given me to finish, the same works that I do bear witness of me that the Father hath sent me. And the Father himself which hath sent me hath borne witness of me. Ye have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his shape. Going off on a tangent a little bit, uh, we're not supposed to be drawing images of God the Father, period. Okay. Neither has he seen his shape. So people keep trying to draw shapes of, of God the Father, and it's just like a ghost image of a, of a physical body. You know? You're not supposed to do that. So we see the Godhead witnesses of who Jesus is. God fully and completely. And here, talking about the Messiah, their king. God manifests in the flesh that is their king. For us today, Jesus is God fully and completely. When it comes to the salvation, Him dying on the cross. All three parts of the Godhead, uh, three things, the brother kind of corrected me to a point, three things, because the Bible says we don't know the things, mystery. I didn't put that down, but um, 
things of the Godhead bear witness to Jesus Christ and who he is. Okay. Now we're going to get into where it gets into the resurrection. Okay. Godhead on the resurrection, Romans 4.16, therefore if it is of faith that it might be by grace. Okay. Romans 4.16, I need to leave a break for you guys to pause it and turn. Okay. Therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace, to the end the promise might be sure to the all seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. This is talking about Abraham had faith and it was counted to him for righteousness. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations, before him whom he believed, even God, who quickened the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were, who again hope, believing in hope, believed in hope, that he might become the father of many nations. According to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body, now dead, when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He trusted God and the promise that he made. He had faith. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. We're always going to keep coming across that glory. You know, we're supposed to give God glory in everything that we do. And being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. And therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. Now it was, now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. There's a Bible if, there's a condition. You want God's righteousness imputed to you? You need to believe in the resurrection that the Godhead raised Jesus from the get dead. And we're going to see this here in a second. Who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. He died for the, our sins that are saved. He died for the sins of the world. You want your sins paid for? You go to the cross. You reject the cross. Your sins aren't paid for. Right? But he rose again for our justification proving that he is God fully and completely, and that his blood washed my sins away. First right. Peter 3.18, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. I did a video on this, but we're going over this again, because it's always great to have this in our minds. So the Holy Spirit raised him from the dead. Remember we talked about, if you don't believe in a resurrection, your faith is, your belief is in vain. Okay. John 2, 19. I'm going to turn to John 2, 19. Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou reel it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. When therefore he was risen from the dead... His disciples remembered that he had said this unto them, and they believed the scriptures and the word which Jesus had said. So there we see Jesus raised himself from the dead. Remember, I'm going to keep hammering this in, the resurrection. If you don't believe in the resurrection, then Jesus' death is in vain. And the people who believe in the Godhead, let's go ahead and get the next part real quick before I get into that. People who don't believe in the Godhead, believe in the Trinity. But Acts 13.30 But God raised him from the dead. Galatians 1.1 1, 1, Another instance. Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. There it flat out spells out God that's referred to in Acts 13.30 is the Father. Okay. Now, if you actually think about it, the Trinity, people who are hardcore Trinitarians that reject the Godhead, body, soul, and spirit, it's actually an attack on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. They say God the Father is a person. They say Jesus is a person. And they say uh, the Holy Spirit is a person. There's three different persons. In that case, only one, only one of them can raise Jesus from the dead. And if Jesus is not God the Father, his blood can do nothing for you. His resurrection's pointless. 
See how they go hand in hand? I'm not against the blood that Jesus shed on the cross. But if you don't believe that Jesus is fully and completely God, your belief is in vain. Mm -hmm. James 1.8, what's going on here when you have people say, I believe in the Trinity and I reject the Godhead, but I, I, I believe in the resurrection. It's double-minded. James 1.8, a double-minded double man is unstable in all his ways. And that's true of the Trinitarians. The hardcore, they just believe the Trinity, reject the Godhead. They're unstable in all their ways. You look at them and say, well, if you don't believe Jesus is God fully and completely, God the Father, then his death is meaningless and his blood on the cross can do nothing for you. And you can't truly believe in the resurrection. You have to believe that all three things of the Godhead, the person, Jesus Christ, he's the only person. Person has a body, soul, and is always referred to someone who is living, spirit. Mm -hmm. Now, there are some people out there that do believe in the Godhead, but they're using Trinity terms. What's going on there? Colossians 2.8, if you want to turn there. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Their deceit will be vain if you stick to this word of God. Okay? Um, and not get spoiled by philosophy. And that's what's going on. They're spoiled by philosophy. You set them down and say, do you believe that God the Father has a body, soul, spirit of his own? No, I don't believe that. That's ludicrous. Praise the Lord. Do you believe the Holy Spirit has a body, soul, spirit of his own? You're just being crazy. Praise the Lord. Not me being crazy, but that they don't believe that. Uh, do you believe Jesus had a body, soul, and spirit? Yeah, Jesus has, is the body. God the Father is the soul. And the Holy Spirit... The Holy Ghost is the Spirit, but they'll still keep saying God in three persons. They'll keep standing for the Trinity. They'll still say God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and it's not there. But those people who reject it and just say God in three persons, Trinity came from the Catholic Church, and they believe it's three separate persons, body, soul, spirit, body, soul, spirit, body, soul, spirit. What's going on here? His re resurrection's in vain, therefore your belief is in vain. If Jesus isn't fully God... His blood can do nothing for you. Mm -hmm. And you don't believe in the real Jesus Christ. Once again, your belief is in vain. So one of the things we see in here that they always attack us, that belief in vain doesn't mean that you're lost. According to Scripture, it does. And what's one of the ways you can believe in vain? You can mess up the resurrection. You can say it never happened. Or you, as we're going to read, you can say it happened, but Jesus isn't God. Well, He's God, but He's not capital G God. Well, if he's a lowercase g God, his blood can do nothing for you. If he's a separate, he's a third of God, his blood can do nothing for you. His resurrection's pointless. The whole point of his resurrection is the Godhead raised him from the dead. Jesus is God. Mm -hmm. Now, what's another way you can believe, believe in vain? Now we're going to get on to works to be saved, okay? If you want to turn to Galatians 2.1. Okay? It actually said that you, your belief is vain if you don't believe in the resurrection. Let's get into people who profess works to be saved. You've earned salvation by what you are doing. Galatians 2.1. Then 14 years after I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also, and I went up by revelation and communicated unto them that gospel which I preached among the Gentiles, but privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. But neither Titus who was with me being a Greek was compelled to be circumcised, and that because of false brethren unaware brought in, who came in privately to spy out our liberty which we have in Christ Jesus. I'll be doing a study on liberty coming up soon. And that they might bring us into bondage. What's the bondage talking about? To whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with us. What's the bondage? Liberty there is talking about an Old Testament law. That's what liberty is. It has to be a law that says you're, you're okay, you have a choice. You can do it or not. It's an Old Testament law that back then they did it to worship God. Today, you can choose to do it. 
Okay. What's it talking about here specifically? It's talking about um, circumcision. The law says you have to be circumcised, but now we don't have to keep the law to be saved. We have the gospel of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. So, if you try to tell that you have to keep the law to be saved, you have to be circumcised to be saved, then you're believing in Jesus Christ in vain. Jesus said on the cross, it is finished. His blood washed your sins away, and his resurrection proved that he is God. But if the gospel is not enough, you have to keep the works to be, do works to be saved, then your belief is in vain. Philippians 2.16 Hold forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Paul said that if we read about the resurrection, it's worthless. His preaching's worthless. His work is worthless. If you don't believe in the death, burial, and resurrection and how Jesus died. Same thing here. If you believe that you have to do works to be saved, then his, he run in vain and his labor is vain. It's not. You don't have to do works to be saved. To get saved, I'm sorry. You don't do good works to get saved. You do good works because you are saved. Right? Galatians 2.21 I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. If it's all about the law and you've got to keep the law, Christ's death is in vain. Mm -hmm. His blood is worthless. Why, why shed His blood that's supposed to wash away our sins if it doesn't work and we have to keep the law to be saved? It's something that we do to earn salvation. It's not what Jesus did, it's what we're doing. Now, people try to bring people back, servants of Satan try to bring people back under the law and belief in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And the thing is, is you look at that and it's like, it, that makes no sense. You can't believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross if you have to keep the law to be saved. It's not finished. Okay. Um, then we get over to the next part. So that's them flat out, you go through Galatians, they're trying to bring them back under the law and that's the liberty. You can choose to do things. You can choose not to do things. Uh, the biggest thing we saw there was circumcision as an example. Right. What's another way people are trying to turn salvation into works and it's no longer the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross? And remember what we talked about. They'll say one thing and then they'll say another. They say this, they say it's double-minded. Oh, we believe this and we believe that. And they go against each other. Right. Faith alone. Right. 2 Corinthians 6, 1. We then, as workers together with him, beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted. And in the day of salvation have I secured thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Verse 3, giving no offense in anything, that the ministry be not blamed. So we're seeing here that, is it possible to receive the grace of God in vain? And we're going to get into it, what it means to receive. It doesn't mean that you got saved. Okay. Mark 4:14, 4, the sower soweth the word, and these are they by the wayside, where the word is sown, but when they heard, Satan cometh immediately and take away the word that was sown in their hearts. Okay. They received the word, the gospel, but it got taken away. Oh yeah, I heard it, but then I got distracted by something and I didn't get saved. Okay, Satan comes in and distracts him with something and takes the word away. They forget about somebody was, what was that guy trying to preach to me? I forgot what he was trying to preach to me. At first they were listening, yeah, they were starting to receive it. But that's not the one that really proves it. 16, And these are they likewise which are sown on stony ground, who, when they have heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness. Oh, it sounds good. Yeah, it'd be pretty cool to be a Christian. Yeah. I mean, my family's a Christian, or my friends are doing it. Sure, why not? It's gladness. And having no root in themselves, they're not saved. They don't, they're not hiding God's word in their heart. And so endure for a time afterward when affliction or persecution arrived for the word's sake, 
ariseth for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. If you guys remember the story about Jesus Christ where he had his disciples, not the apostles, the apostles were with him, but he also had disciples. And when he started preaching, I think it was on the, uh, the flesh and the blood, that was something they couldn't handle. So what happened? They left him and walked with him no more. Okay. The true gospel, the true plan of salvation, people will say, oh, it sounds great, sure. But when they get offended, they turn their backs on the gospel. Mm -hmm. 18, they turn their back on the grace of God. And these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word, and the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the lust of other things entered in, choke the word, and it become unfruitful. You got people that preach the gospel, but they ignore the changed life. They don't tell them, you know, what it means to be a Christian until after they're supposedly saved. And when they realize, this is what I got myself into, I don't want this. They received the gospel. God's grace was there for them to receive. Yet they don't want it. And what happens? They start, because of the lust of their... Um, the deceitfulness of riches and the lust of other things in, that comes in and they like, we just kept talking about it. They decided, well, I don't like the real Jesus of the King James Bible, so I'll create my own Jesus. And what's going on? They're receiving the grace of God in vain. They're believing in a wrong Jesus Christ, the, a Jesus Christ that conforms to them. 20, and these are they which are sown on good ground, such as hear the word and receive it. And bring forth fruit, some thirtyfold, some sixty, and some a hundred. They actually received the word of God. What's the evidence? I had to put that down. Evidence that grace was not received in vain. They bring forth fruit, some thirtyfold, some sixty, and some a hundred. The changed life is evidence of salvation. Fruits meet for repentance. It proves that you truly repented, which meant you could truly believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. That's how the evidence that you have not re, um, that you don't, you didn't receive God's grace in vain. Ephesians 2.8, so now we're going to get into this. The famous Ephesians 2.8 that they like to quote, the faith alone people. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship created in in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Bottom line, if you're saved by your faith, you have earned God's grace and can sin all you want. And that's what it's all about. No, I'm not saved by God's grace. I'm saved by my faith through God's grace. Okay? There is no changed life. And if you say there is, those of us who stand to the Bible, would it just say in verse 10 that they hate to quote, that we are created in Christ Jesus unto good works. When you get saved, you're a new creature in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. So if we preach to change life, they'll turn around and throw it on us saying we're teaching works about salvation when they're the ones that are really teaching it. How do we know that? Look at the lives these easy believism live, the fruits of easy believism. I've come across them a lot. And it's all about sin justifying sin in the sense that, well, yeah, it's probably wrong, or yeah, the Bible says it's wrong, but you know what? If you try to hold me accountable to the Bible when it comes to the changed life, you're working, you're doing works-based salvation. Okay. 2 Corinthians 5.18, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. All things. What did we just read in verse 10? Uh, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. When the old man is dead and buried, you're created in Christ Jesus, a new creature, and unto good works. Galatians 6.15, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. It's not about the law anymore. It's about being a new creature in Christ Jesus. It goes from being 100% about the flesh to 100% about Jesus Christ. But these people like to say that they're saved by their faith. What did they do? They just turn faith into works. What's the evidence of that? They can sin all they want. They get to be God deciding what is sin and what's not sin. They're their own God. Romans 6, 1. What, say, let's see, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. And that's what they're all about. 
I've saved by my faith, therefore I can sin all I want. Okay? The sin, uh, was it, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And those that say yes, they're receiving God's grace in vain. Okay? God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any there longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us that were, as were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death? Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father. There's another thing about God the Father raising him from the dead. Even so, we also shall walk in newness of life. Part of the evidence of we're being resurrected with Jesus Christ is you have a new life. You're a new creature in Christ Jesus. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Okay. You're not to continue in sin that grace may abound. And those people that are faith alone, they've turned it in faith into works. They've earned it with their faith. They can sin all they want. Great, they sin so grace may abound. Oh, we don't do that. Double-minded. They say one thing, do another. They say they believe this, but when they say they believe this over here, it contradicts each other. I, I don't believe in the Godhead, I believe in the Trinity. Then you don't believe in the resurrection of Jesus being God fully and completely. Well, I still believe in the resurrection. Then you believe that Jesus Christ that died on the cross is God the Father. He's God fully and completely. There's only one God, the Father. Time and time again, one God, one God, one God, one God. And you know, what they do is, well, yeah, there's one God, but three lesser gods that make up one God. Double-minded. Mm -hmm. 2 Thessalonians 2.10 2 Thessalonians 2, chapter 2, verse 10. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they believe not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusions that they should believe a lie. Not only are they believing in vain, but they're believing a lie that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Ultimately, any perversion of the gospel is all about them keeping their flesh and continuing in sin. Mm -hmm. That's what it's all about. So, I'm going to move on to part two, because this has been a little, a little bit, and my feet are getting tired. I have a hard time standing for long periods of time. But hopefully the first part, you've gotten it. The two biggest things that pretty much when we're going to get into part two, you're going to see this in all these false religions. Okay? They attack the Godhead, which in turn attacks the true resurrection, Jesus Christ's blood being God's blood. Okay? And some of them just attack the resurrection right out, flat out. There is no resurrection. Okay? So you have that, and then you have... Um, works. They turn things into works where you're earning salvation or you've earned salvation. You look for these two things and all these false uh, religions that claim to be um, Christian, you'll find it. The only true religion that believes that Jesus is fully and completely God is Bible-believing, God-fearing men and women, brothers and sisters in Christ out there. Okay. We believe in the Godhead because that's what the Bible says. It doesn't say Trinity. We believe that Jesus is the person of the Godhead because that's what the Bible says. Four times Jesus is referenced as a person. God the Father is never referenced as a person, and the Holy Spirit is never referenced as a person. We believe the Bible and the true resurrection because it says the Godhead, not the word Godhead, but it says that all three things of the Godhead, body, soul, and spirit, raise Jesus from the dead. And if you don't believe this, then God's righteousness will not be imputed to you. You're not believing in the real resurrection of a Jesus that's God fully and completely. Your Jesus is fake. He's false. He's a counterfeit. You're believing in vain. Okay. So works, you believe in vain. You don't believe in the true gospel, uh, the true Godhead of the King James Bible and the true resurrection of God, Jesus being God fully and completely. You're believing in vain works. You're believing in vain. Evidently, Jesus, it wasn't finished. He made a mistake in saying it is finished. 
Okay. So now we're going to move on to some examples into part two. So I'll see you in part two.